with over 400 celebrity interviews and tons of pop culture nerdiness, Too Opinionated is a safe haven for your inner geek. Find us at MeisterCon.com or on YouTube under MeisterCon Pod. And please subscribe. It would really help us out. Thanks, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Too Opinionated. I'm beside myself. Look who I have with me today. It's pianist, keyboardist, guitarist, composer, Hall of Famer, David Sanctions. Welcome, David. Thank you, man. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Tell me, I believe that you are our first. We've done, we're only a couple away from 500 episodes, right. which we're pretty, pretty excited about. But I'm pretty sure you are the first person from Hawaii that we've talked to. Okay. All right. That's an, at least an done the interview from, in Hawaii. Yeah. I was telling you uh, off camera that if I'd known, I'd have just come down there. We'd done it in person, maybe set on the beach. Yeah. Well, there you go. Anytime you want to make that happen, I can accommodate my schedule for you. <laughs> Don't be throwing that out there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You'll get a knock at your door and I'll be standing there with my equipment. <laughs> a couple of years ago, well, I did an interview for Rolling Stone magazine, and it was a phoner. And I decided to, uh, we were living in a different part of town, it's a little closer to the beach than we are right now. And I decided to go down to my favorite place and where where you can park and then, you know, hang, you can just see the ocean and just space out in the ocean. So I yeah. drove down there and I have this thing in my car where you can put your cell phone audio through the car speakers. And it's super comfortable. <laughs> Talking. I did the whole interview in the car, like looking at the ocean. You know, oh, that's amazing. Worked out great. Worked out really yeah. well. I mean, that's pretty good because I've done a few car interviews and it's oh. it's hit and miss. Yeah. You gotta have the right spot. You have the right spot, you gotta have a good audio. Yeah. You gotta have very good audio. That's exactly right. When we started this podcast, my son and I, we didn't know what we were doing. And we were holding, we weren't using Zoom. And we're just right. holding a phone up to a microphone. It's terrible. <laughs> We've gotten a little better since then. <laughs> so, yeah. David, I I know you've uh, you've went through this a, a million times, but I, I think it's a a really good story, especially for other musicians out there. Tell me a little bit about what got you into the music business. You know, what made you want to become a, a musician and learn to play those instruments? Well, music itself. You know, I can I can honestly say that I had I had the good fortune to be the youngest uh, in a family of five. Yeah. Mom and dad and two older brothers. And you were the baby. I was the baby, the youngest one for sure. Nobody's coming after me. That was it. <laughs> and uh, they all had their own uh, great individual sense of, of their own personal taste of what they liked musically. My mother's taste in music was very specific and different from my father's they kind of overlapped a little bit but the same way my father's taste in music was very dis distinct and different from my mom's and my older brother's was different from both of theirs and uh my middle brother uh who i'm closest to he has his own very sort of eclectic sense which is sort of more like my own you know but he also yeah ended up turning me on to a lot of music that I'd never heard before. And then uh, after all that influence of four people, I had my own ideas and, and reactions to, to the world and mu music that I was hearing uh, at the time. So I just feel like I was really blessed to just be literally drowning in music of all kinds and, and liking almost every bit of it, you know, finding something interesting to uh, to love and um, get into. And as far as making me want to learn how to play the piano, again, that's some magical, mysterious thing. I just, uh, uh, it, it probably goes back to my mother in terms of wanting to physically know how to play the instrument yeah. before I got turned on to other famous pianists of any genre. But I didn't know my mother could play the piano until I was about five years old. And we moved from Asbury Park to Belmar, New Jersey. Yeah. And there was a piano, an upright piano included in the sale of the house. And so as we it's walked It's because in, those things are so heavy. Well, they're so heavy in the particular former owners, neither one of them played for some reason. It was more like a piece of furniture for them rather than... <laughs> 
an <laughs> instrument that they were trying to do anything with or enjoy. Because if it was, they wouldn't have left it behind. I'm sorry. So, but to our good fortune, um, it was. So as we're bringing our stuff into this new house, I'm about five, five and a half years old. And I bring my, my whole job was to bring my toy box in and, you know, put it somewhere out of the way while the big people did real stuff, you know. And my mom got a second, she brought some stock boxes in and then she sat down and started playing this piano. And I was mesmerized completely. Like you thought, you know, to have, you think you know someone and what they can and can't do, or what they do or don't do. And it's, she had this sort of, it was like magic. Like, who are you lady? I didn't know you could, <laughs> she, played really, she played really, really well. When I was in her younger years, when I was five years old, my mom really played, uh, played pretty nicely. She studied classical music when she was younger. And um, she was really into uh, Chopin and Beethoven and Debussy. And she was, and it was like a release for her because for years she didn't have access to an instrument in her own home. You know, she would, and I, I this is beyond That's me because she taught in another school system. She would, I was told that she would play at uh, assemblies and stuff because there's an, a piano in the auditorium in elementary schools. But I never heard that and I never physically saw her do it. So I was just really captivated by watching her and I would sit on the steps right next to the piano and just watch her for hours. And then uh, I've been watching her for a long time, one particular day. And she used to also play a lot of church hymns, you know? Yeah. Uh, we were church hymns, you know? Episcopalian church is like Catholic light. You know, that's the- <laughs> that's a, You know, I've never heard it called that, but that actually fits really well. Oh, it totally, it totally is that, totally is. But anyway, she was playing this one church hymn one day and she got up and I'd been watching her for a long time, just washing her hands. And she got up to go in the kitchen to uh, check on some food she was cooking. And uh, I went and sat on the bench real quick and I just sort of poked around like one or two fingers. And I tried to put my hand where I thought she put her hand and I just pecked out the melody of this uh, um, church hymn. Actually it was called Hark the Herald the Angels Sing. To be, you'll hear it at Christmas time, you know? Of course. And she came running back into, came running back in the kitchen uh, from the kitchen and she said well, do that again what you just did <laughs> so I pecked it out again, and she said she'll slide over move over and then she sat down next to me and showed me you know the rest of the melody and the right way to w which finger to use to play the melody but that was the beginning of my piano lessons from her and she taught me for a year uh, on her own and then she found me a virtuoso pianist named James Connell who used yeah. to teach in Neptune. He taught art in the Neptune uh, school system, Neptune, New Jersey. He was not able to make a living as a classical recital pianist, but he was he was good enough to. He had trained for all that, you know. And she got me lessons with him. I studied with him for about eight years, and um, it was great. The sort of the physical foundation of of my um, my musical ability with the piano. But I was already influenced by other stuff. Like, for instance, I mentioned my dad. My dad was a huge jazz fan. Right. And he used to take me to concerts, you know, with him when I was way underage. I saw people. <laughs> I shouldn't have even been in the building. But my dad took me. That's just knew. good parenting. Yeah, well, it was great. It was, you know, one of the one of the things that he did right. Um, and uh, at the same time, I'm being influenced by classical music. My oldest brother was very into avant-garde jazz, um, uh, Sun Ra and um, the really avant-garde side of that stuff. And all of us, uh, myself and both my brothers were into Coltrane and what contemporary jazz of the time, all these different artists. And my middle brother is the one who turned me on to Jimi Hendrix. And that was like the start of a whole other, you know, education. And I started playing piano and guitar rather when I was about seven or so. Yeah. And I had begged, begged my mom for a, a guitar. And finally she broke down and got me out from this pawn shop in South Belmar. Uh, she got me an electric guitar. And then my brother brought home uh, the first Jimi Hendrix album. And that totally just like, like a lot of people, it blew, blew my mind. And so that was the start of the whole, you know, uh, adventure playing guitar. 
Yeah, I, I think that's that's amazing. And, I, and we've all kind of been through some of that. Most of us don't have the ability to actually play, you know. So, but a lot of us were influenced by uh, uh, Hendrix and some of the uh, jazz musicians as we were growing up. And I was like, okay, well, I did the same thing. I was like, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna learn to play piano. Was what I was. You know, it, it sort of it changes your life when you hear it musically. Whether you actually get to the level of you physically wanting. That's right. Instrument. There's so much energy in it that it, it affects you as a, as a, as a person. You know, you sort of yeah. take that with you when you go back out into the world and be a person. You know, so it's uh, it's pretty amazing what music. I'm pretty is. sure that my poor aunt, who was a music teacher, mm -hmm. I think I I ruined her because I was so bad on a piano. She tried for two years to teach me, and nothing. It was terrible. And, you know, I come from, a, um, my family was Baptist. My, my grandfather was a Baptist minister. So everybody in the family was musical. You know, and right. my mother plays piano and, and all of that, and none of it took. But <laughs> the appreciation is still there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And well, you, you only need to hear it once. And it, once you get it, once it's in you, you can't unhear something, which is really interesting. You can't you you can ignore something, but something that really affects you like that, uh, again, you may never get to physically address it uh, on the instrument, but it's yeah. it's in your spirit, you know. Do you play uh, by ear? Uh, I play both. I, I can sight read music. Okay. I can write music, and I play by ear also. Yeah, yeah that's uh, I, I've always uh, been fascinated with people that can hear something and then and then play it that just seems yeah. amazing to me my mother does some of that I've, my stepson he can pick up any instrument if you give him 20 minutes and yeah. play him something he'll play it cool. and it just amazes me yeah he uh he's he's 21 he had he had a local band that needed a uh, keyboardist he'd never played piano or keyboard but he had an old broken beat up keyboard and he took that in and fiddled around with it a little bit and learned enough to go and and play for him and, and now he's he's in the band now he's their keyboardist there you go and that just that just amazes me that that there's start somewhere you know? yeah you got to start somewhere with okay. that that's i i love those stories of of how people uh got started in the 60s and the 70s were such a great time for music it you was. Know, I grew up at that time too, and you know you had uh, uh, the Beatles in there and, and Elvis. You still had Motown uh, mm -hmm. that was so big. Disco was going on. Jazz. There was just so much. You know, did you take a lot of that influence and put that oh, in your own music? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You no, know, you can't make a disconnect from it. You can't make a disconnect from the existence of all that to the influence it had on me, to the music that came through me. It's just like yeah. a soft thread of all those different uh, elements, whether it was Hendrix, Joni Mitchell, um, just so much, you know? Yeah. And that was time too when people, when musicians started uh, being interested in other genres of music. For instance, you know, you had a lot of classical players who became interested in playing jazz. Yeah, A lot of um, rock players uh, jazz players who were interested and in, wanted to know like about rock and roll, you know, rhythmically. So even these terms like jazz rock and, you know, that right. was a, and fusion music. That was another term I used to like fusion music. Great. This fusion of, you know, maybe the, maybe the rhythmic element is from uh, Asia or Africa and the harmonic element is from Europe and, you know, yeah. some other and somewhere else. It's, but that was an amazing time. I don't, uh, I think it had such legs that I don't I don't sort of see that being repeated. Maybe it can't be repeated. It's like the the genie's out of the bottle and it's it's just <laughs> self-replicating. I mean that, that's why we that's why it's still popular, don't you think? Yeah. I mean that's yeah. we keep going back to those decades. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's pretty uh pretty great. So my mother said to to tell you that I was telling her that you were coming on. She was a big uh, tone fan or still oh, is. Oh nice, yeah. thank you. So she wanted to 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 say hello because I'm sure you get uh, a lot of that. And she, yeah, she uh, absolutely loves 
uh, especially um, the piano. Mm -hmm. you know, when she loves the, the the listening to to people that can really play the piano and always has. And I, so yeah, so she wanted to mention that. I was like, yeah, I'll let him know. <laughs> say hi, say hi from me. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. So I love the story of how you and uh, Bruce met. Can yeah. you tell a little bit about that real quick? That was, oh man, I can't peg the year, but I'm going to say I was, uh, I was born in 1953 and I was all of, uh, I think I was 15 going on 16. Yeah. So whatever year that would, uh, <laughs> make it. Uh, I used to go to, there was Late a club 60, in somewhere in there. There we go. Yeah. Um, I used to go to this club called, uh, Upstage in Asbury Park in New Jersey. And, um, back in those days, it was easy to get around because either somebody, your friend had a car or you knew somebody who had a car, you was, that was the time of like, you know, hitchhiking and getting places, which is not yeah. happening. It's not now. <laughs> no anyway, I used to get to this club and this one night in the summertime, um, I couldn't, you know, get a ride with anyone who was going in that direction from Belmar to Asbury Park is eight miles. So I just decided to walk it. It was a beautiful summer night. You know, I got all the energy in the world. I'm like barely 16 years old. So I, just and it's a straight line. You get on Main Street in Omar, and it's a straight line to uh, <laughs> to Cookman Avenue in Asbury Park. And it's eight miles. It's pleasant. So I walked there this one particular night, and uh, I walked up the steps, and I had seen Gary Talent at the top of the stairs. We had met uh, a couple of weeks before at a recording session for someone in in uh, someone locally. There was some local who had their own studio. And somehow I ended up on this session uh, with, yeah. uh, I think I was playing Hammond organ and Gary's a bass player. So as I'm walking up the stairs into upstage, Gary recognizes me and he and Bruce are standing side by side at the top of the stairs. And he introduces me to Bruce and they say, hey, Bruce this is my friend, Dave Sanchez. And Bruce goes, Hey, we're organizing a jam session for the, for the next, next part, you know, which was like about, uh, what to talk. I think it was going to be from like one o'clock to five because the place used to open at nine and had to clear out at midnight for an hour. <laughs> it was a weird New Jersey liquor law kind of situation. We really, they literally had to let everyone out of the building for an hour. You could people were milling around outside on the street. And then at one o'clock sharp, they'd open the door again. You could come back in. Yeah, that's weird. Care. It was weird. So we, uh, He's, I said, sure, you know, I'm happy to, great to meet you, I'd love to play. And we ended up playing for a couple of hours, you know, we played most of that set from, because it was just this jam session when people were coming up and down, like different drummers would come up, different people would, but this, the music went on, it seemed to me pretty much continuous from like one o'clock until the place closed at five. Wow. I stayed up there for quite a long time playing organ something and and uh it was great so that that was my first night of meeting him and playing with him i knew who he was before i met him because he was locally very famous already he had the most popular band on the show at the time so after that was over uh we're walking out together and i think either he or his he or his girlfriend at the time somebody had a car and they were headed in my direction towards Belmar and he said you want to ride I said yeah I'll catch a ride with you and uh he said listen I'm about to break up this band I've got called Steel Mill and I want to do something brand new would you be interested in being a keyboard player and yeah I said, absolutely and that was that's really the you know the start of all that so much stuff happened after that way before it was there was a lot of music and a lot of different ensembles way before it was ever called the E Street Band. Yeah. Where did that name come from? Where, where did did one of you live on E Street? I, I did. Apparently I'm the only one who did. But yeah, I lived on I'm the only one who lived on E Street. Well, that's kind of funny. That's kind of funny. What so what if you had lived on know, Main Street? Could have been called the Main Street Band. You know, Washington Avenue or something. It's been called the Washington <laughs> Avenue Band, that's true. <laughs> you have to ask why that he's he said at the time i've read something he said uh in the papers a quote as to why he called it that but 
I'll leave that for you to find. I just think he he liked um he liked the environment on my street. I grew up in a very uh, interracial environment. Yeah. In my, you know, we moved from um where we lived in Asbury Park on the west side of the tracks was mostly black and, and working class, a mixture of like white, but that was the wrong side of the tracks, quotation mark. But when we moved to Belmar, we moved to the right side of the tracks. We're on the eastern side, closer to the ocean, with a, a bigger house and, and everything. And my neighborhood there, my neighborhood in Asbury Park was almost exclusively, I think, uh, black. There might have been one white family on a corner house somewhere. But when we moved into Belmar on uh, East Street, uh, it was completely mixed. Like on my street, uh, on East Street itself, between 11th and 12th, uh, there was my family who was black. The people next door to us were a Jewish family and they were school teachers. The people next door to them was a white Jewish family and they were lawyers. Yeah. People right across the street from us was a black family and the wife was a nurse and the husband was a, a landscaper. The person next to him was the rabbi of the uh, of the town and the synagogue of Belmar was right around the corner <laughs> The people on the opposite side of us were a black family, and they were also uh, uh, teachers. My husband and wife were both school yeah. teachers. The person across the street from them was an Italian family, and he was a construction guy. It just, that area went on like that. So I think he saw, I don't know, when they used to come pick me up, you know, for for gigs, because again, I didn't, I didn't get a driver's license until I was like 19 or something, 19 or 20. But when they used to come pick me up to uh, take us to where we were going, I think he just had a sense of, um, you know, something about the neighborhood. It's like we were all getting along just fine. Yes. And I, I think he also had a little bit of a flavor of it because my mom did let us a couple of times uh, rehearse in our garage at our house and uh, maybe once or twice in the basement kind of thing. So he got a little experience of what it's like just to be on the street and see people come and go in and see how it was all working out nicely you know it has to be pretty amazing looking back on it because i'm guessing if it's like the rest of us you know some of the best times of your life are when you're a young teenager early 20s and you don't even realize that it's the best time but but looking back yeah. that had to be yeah, when you, it is amazing to look back on it and just realize I feel I feel grateful that uh, what happened happened and, and it's had such a positive result in people's lives, you know, uh, not yeah. just my, you know, um, but it is it's pretty amazing to just think about, man, just for a few things being different, you know, how would we even have met each other or, yeah. you know what would not have happened you know <laughs> or what would have happened it's pretty crazy but um no we're we're very happy we were very happy to to get reunited briefly on this project uh that we just did for uh, for his new record uh, only the strong survive we did um four songs for the jimmy fallon show yeah yeah that's yeah. I, that's that's pretty uh pretty terrific. Uh, what uh, what were the songs? Are they new songs, or were you doing some older stuff? No, his his whole new album is called "Only the Strong Survive," and it's a it's an album full of soul music, an R and B yeah. music, soul, some from the Motown era, and before and 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 after. And if you look on it, uh, this I believe it's still up there on YouTube. If you type in Springsteen, Jimmy Fallon, there's yeah. four separate performances and. Uh, I think we did Night Shift also. Oh, I is, saw that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one gave me chills. Because everybody other, knows that song. Yeah, and exactly. You guys did such a great job on that one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's 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 what that was about. So this that was the first time that we have physically played together on a stage, playing music together since 1980. 1988, the Amnesty International tour it was wow. either 80 or 89. And I sat in, and that was a tour that had uh, Bruce, Peter Gabriel. I was playing with Peter Gabriel at the time, Sting, Yusu Endure, and Tracy Chapman. And somewhere on that tour, uh, he asked me to sit in. I think we were in California. 
but I sat in with him. But that was the first time since then that I'm physically on the stage with him playing music. And uh, it was great. We had two rehearsals before the TV taping. Both Each rehearsal was fabulous and easy. Everyone's very prepared. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then the taping went well for TV. I don't know, you know, television can be kind of, uh, a little bit restrictive sometimes and maybe not so comfortable it depends on on the artist what you're doing or what show you're on like I've done Saturday Night Live a couple of times with uh, I've done it at least twice with Sting and uh, I don't know, once with someone I'm not thinking of it now but it can be an uncomfortable experience physically but luckily the way that they had it all set up at uh, at NBC for um, for that particular show it was uh, it was comfortable you know, and yeah. it was 19 people. It's like a 19 piece ensemble between the choir, the brass section. Yeah, you had a big group for that. 19 of us. It was amazing. So yeah. I it, it, yeah, I, yeah, I watched some of that. I didn't realize that was on the, the new album, but yeah, that was yeah. excellent. Yeah, yeah. Said, it gave me chills. All of that stuff's on the new album. He's working on a volume two of that right now. And uh, I'm going to be, I'm on one song on volume one, and uh, I just got a text from him. I've, I've got a concert to do in Red Bank, New Jersey on the 6th of January. Yeah. And I'm going to have a panel discussion on the 7th because it's the 50th anniversary of uh, the release of Greetings from Asbury Park. Wow. And they're going to have to believe that's been 50 uh, years. <laughs> so they're going to have an event at Monmouth College. Uh, in New Jersey, so I'm going to stay around for that panel discussion, and I think there's going to be a little performance at the end of that. And then I think before I come back home to Hawaii, uh, he wants me to come to his studio and do a another session or two for the new record. So, uh, I mean, that's yeah. exciting. I'm assuming if you get a text or a phone call from Bruce Still, even if it's been years, you answer the phone. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we kind of lately we've been texting, you know, pretty regularly, which is nice, you know, and um, yeah, I get a phone. Uh, we don't email so much, but we we do text back and forth about different stuff. Yeah. Well, none of us talk on the phone or email anymore. It's all text. <laughs> and depends on who and what for. But um, that's right. Yeah. I remember that tour back. I think it was 88. Um, I was a Eight. senior in high school. And everybody was so excited for that because of the lineup. That lineup was amazing. Yeah, it was. It was quite a show. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty great. So last year, if I'm remembering right, you released your tenth album. Yes, Eyes Wide Open, my tenth album. I can barely believe it myself. Uh, yeah. Has your yeah. has your music changed over the years to where your tenth album is different from Absolutely. those early ones? Absolutely. I, in fact, I couldn't imagine a state where my 10th album sounds anything like the first album. Yeah. I look at, I look at composing like an author looks at writing a, a book, a novel or a short story or a screenplay or yeah. whatever. Each story is its own story and it sort of tells itself. You know what I mean? The story will tell you exactly what needs to happen and what needs to not happen in order for it to be really true and energetically correct as the story that you're feeling because all of this starts as feeling it doesn't really start it all comes out of nothing you basically realize when someone does something like that okay if you're a guitar player okay bruce said this other thing one day this kid gave him a guitar somewhere he was in Europe, some Spain or somewhere. Yeah. And a fan walks up to him and gives him a guitar, like a gift. Didn't even have a case in it, okay? So he takes it home and he says, to his great delight, it's actually a really good instrument, right? Yeah. So he gets a case for this thing and he's just so curious about it. He kept it by his bed for a while, okay? Now he claims that an entire album of music was written for, on that guitar. He goes, that when, it, when he wow. went next to it up all those songs were sort of just because he touched that instrument it's so it's all so mysterious you know yeah it's very, very mysterious and the, the experience of playing this instrument was somehow so satisfying that it let like this floodgates of, of music come out you know and that. that's what happens if you're playing a piano whatever whatever the instrument is when i sit down at, a, at an instrument whether it's a synthesizer or an organ piano 
there's a moment where it's the first time you touch the thing. There's just that moment where how you've touched it and now some sound is coming out. That first contact physically is like everything. It's like someone's pushing you down the stream. You're in the boat and now here, there you go. Because that very first innocent touch will lead to the next touch and the next touch. And then all that experience is when I don't know the word, I understand the word inspiration when it comes from, it's actually a good word, but whatever that energy is, that's when it happens. You have to engage with the instrument physically. You know, you can't look at the guitar and wait for the song to come. You can't, you can't, I can't look at all the keys and think about it. But the minute that you actually engage with it, that's the start of the magic. And then it informs you. And then if you check this out, and you already know this, but if you, if a person really improvises, which I think is one of my uh, highest skills is to be able to improvise. I can yeah. create, or, or music can come through me out of thin air and it will be so concrete and so well put together that you will think it was something that I wrote and rehearsed, you know? There's people, that's how people can do it. The pianist, uh, like Keith Jarrett. Yeah. Uh, Korea, Herbie Hancock. There are people like that who that's what that's what will come out of you after years of development, that you'll be able to sit down and without looking at a piece of music or knowing a melody, just engage with the instrument in real time and watch all this music come through you. And it, it's, you know, it's amazing. I don't know if you're familiar with Keith Jarrett and people like that, what they do, but that's that was his, uh, he, he, he played a lot of solo piano when we did entire yeah. concerts is improvising on the instrument and the music is it's breathtaking it's breathtaking so amazing yeah herbie hancock was always favorite yeah i probably went too far on your question I no no I that was terrific because i i love to hear how that works i've heard similar things from from authors mm -hmm. you know they say it's you know they may not have any idea but when they when they put that pen to paper they mm -hmm. kind of the inspiration uh, comes or the energy comes. So that's, that's neat listening to it from a, a musical side. No, that's exactly the way it's been for me. But in terms of it being different, it's kind of like the last thing I want to do is repeat myself. I don't right. really want to repeat myself unless it's a conceptual thing. You know, like what Bruce is doing, like a, a volume one of a certain style in volume two. That's not really repeating yourself because there's all different songs. Sure. You know? I don't want to have a thing where I do like a song, an album that's got eight or some songs on it of a certain style and then have the next one come out and be another eight songs in that world. I think it's almost like it's not being sincere, true to your own journey in the world. I just don't feel the way that I felt, you know, um, in 1970. When did that record come out? Forest of Feelings, 76. 72, 70, yeah, 70. Five, six, somewhere in there. Somewhere a long there. time ago. Long time ago, a minute ago. <laughs> well, and that makes sense because you go through so much during a lifetime sure. that there's no way that things don't change as you go along. It would be, it almost be a little disappointing if, if you stayed exactly the same. It would be more than disappointing. It would be sort of emotionally dishonest in a way. Yeah. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be... Um, image of you still there i'm still here yeah that freeze audience? up for a second yeah for a second and lost audio yeah. now did leslie speak to you about this project that they're trying to do for me in uh, in belmar new jersey about this piano? yeah so so they're yeah. they're donating a weatherproof piano yeah. but it's not just your name it's for your mother too is that right mother too because my mom was very influential in the community she helped a lot of people in terms of education and uh, she was not a piano teacher. She was actually an elementary school teacher, but um, she taught myself piano and maybe I think one other person that I recently heard about. But this is the instrument. It's from it's from Israel, and there's wow. only about three or four of them installed on the planet. And it's an actual digital piano in a concrete case, so it's weatherproof, and it accepts USB files. So I and other musicians and people can actually create music put in a USB stick and this thing will play it, you know, oh, like a love that. 
digital player piano. So they've been asking for, uh, they approached me with this sometime earlier this year. And I was, of course, just bowled away. It's an incredible thing to do for, for, for my family, for myself to honor it. But if you go to, you can't see it on the cilia, this little QR code here, but if you go to uh, www.belmararts, that's B-E-L-M-A-R-T-S dot org, and you'll have a whole history about the piano, what they're trying to do, and we're trying to get donations to have it coincide with an anniversary of the town of Belmar itself. 150, is, right? Exactly. That is actually technically passed, but we're trying to get all the funding up to uh, continue it to the next one or or, or before, you know, to, to celebrate it. Love that. If you go to that site, you can make a donation to the instrument. It's going really well. They just had a fundraiser for it. Uh, on the beach in Belmar the other day, and um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a fun project. I look forward to when we can actually have the inauguration of it um, uh, in town at some point in the future. Yeah, do you make it back to Belmar very often? Uh, not very often, but I'm going to be going in a couple of weeks. I have a concert there in uh, Red Bank, New Jersey, at the um, uh, what is it called? Uh, the Vogel Theater. Yeah, with my yeah, is my, is is that something attached with uh, Bruce's? It it is. It's going to be his building there. <laughs> it's going to be before the day, um, b before the day of the panel discussion starts. So my concert is in Red Bank at the Vogel Theater on the sixth of January, and it's going to be with Will Calhoun, the percussionist from uh, Living Color. Yeah. Yeah, yeah oh, he's a, oh, he's so good. Awesome. We have a project called Open Secret um, that we did a short tour of back in 2018. And uh, we're going to actually have enough. We recorded everything live. We did a short tour of the Northeast, but we recorded everything. And we've also got some music that we did in my studio in Woodstock before we moved here. So we're wow. going to revive that project now that the whole COVID experience has, has passed us. But that's going to be a good show on the 6th. Uh, at the Vogel and Red Bank. And then the next day is going to be the panel discussion about uh, greetings from Asbury Park. But they've actually, it's sold out so quickly that they've actually moved it from the Vogel to uh, Monmouth College. Oh, very uh, nice. Yeah. Oh. Get some more people in there. Yeah. But if you go to, um, uh, again, www.belmararts with one L, B E L M A R. A-R-T-S dot org. You'll have a link to see the piano project. You can make a donation and more information about um, the upcoming uh, panel discussion as well. I love that. Yeah. I th what, what a great uh, kind of tribute, especially with your mother involved. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Especially. Yeah. Yeah. Con congratulations on that. That's Thank terrific. You. Yeah, well, David, thank you so much. This is a this has been a real honor. I, I'm it's such a fan fun. of your. I'm a fan of yours, but through my mother, I'll give her the credit for it because uh -huh. you playing that that music of yours, you know, and I probably recognized you from uh, Tone before I knew that you were part of a uh, E Street band, mm -hmm. even though yeah. I'd heard that music before. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. I just didn't. Yeah, at that time I was young enough. I didn't didn't realize uh, I couldn't tell the musicians apart. But that's uh, uh, you've been musically in my life, my entire life. Pretty go. great. Yeah, you've, I was going to say now you you froze up on me. I, I hope you didn't freeze again. How old no, are you? I'm still here. So I I just turned fifty three this October. I was born in okay. uh, this is this is. This is why you wouldn't wouldn't know of the early East Street band because I just turned sixty nine. Yep, a couple of weeks ago. So there's that golf. You we would have you would a little have... bit of golf there. So I, I heard. <laughs> I remember the music. Yeah, just didn't know any of the individuals. You know, I was just listening, especially back then. You're listening to you know LPs. You're listening to. The well, album. listen, man. Give my best to your mom. Please do that Will. and thank her for for me. Is there, I got a quick question, a couple quick ones for you before you go. Is there, is there a musician, if you could go back and pick any musician to play with, is there someone out there that you would love to play with? Alive or dead? Are you talking about people still uh, living? Yeah, either one. Okay. 
uh, a dead person that I would like really uh, just do anything. I, I always said if he was still alive, I would have camped out on Jimi Hendrix's doorstep. <laughs> I would have begged him to let me be in his band, you know, yeah. because the mischief we could have gotten into between right. his brilliant playing and singing and writing and me being able to do what I do on keyboards and playing guitar and and possibly singing it just it just could have been such an amazing live we could have recreated live uh all of the magic that he did in the studio you know he was amazing Hendrix was incredible live to do live versions of his songs with the, with a guitar that didn't stay in tune the way guitars modern guitars do now there's yeah. devices and things that will keep that guitar in tune for the whole show if you no matter what you're doing with it you know but he was just just such an inspiration to me. So I as, figured that too, you big. As a dead person, let's say uh, Hendrix, as someone who's living that I would really like to work with, that I haven't worked with at all. Wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Probably not a ton out there. Well, <laughs> no, this, this, that's a lot. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great musicians. Um, because I didn't have one particular name, you, you've set me off thinking about greatness now. And I'm sort of spinning out <laughs> the possibilities of like, yeah, who who would that be that I haven't worked with that I would really uh, like to still? Hmm. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it up. You might not be familiar with this musician, but... Before Will and I did um, did our duo together called Open Secret, yeah. uh, about a year or so, or maybe half a year before that, I had tried to do uh, a project with similar nature, keyboards and, and percussion, with a British musician named Gary Husband. Oh, yeah, I don't know that one. Okay, well, he's a, he was a child prodigy uh, on the piano. He's one of these people like Chick and Keith. They were just a, a child prodigy, classical piano. But you probably know of him as the drummer for um, uh, what was it, not Ten CC. Shoot, I got the whole um, band wrong. He's a drummer in a famous British band. I'm gonna. It's not Ten CC. That's why my old brain is not working now. But he also has worked with John McLaughlin and a lot of jazz artists. He is at one time an incredible pianist, but he's a brilliant drummer. This I gotta look him up. Art as a drummer and I'm uh, my apologies to everyone out there who knows what <laughs> I'm trying to remember in my head that they'll Gary be screaming at the screen as they're as they're level watching. level 42 oh uh, level 42 okay level 42 yeah, yeah. they had a couple of hit records and you know he played percussion in that I think he probably composed but at the same time he is an incredible uh, pianist and composer so uh maybe one day we'll do something together but That'd be great. Well, um, David, before you go, um, where can we find you on social media? Uh, you can find me at my my site, uh, uh, www.davidsanchez.com. That's got my own personal site. Um, yep. You can also get CDs at uh, Headstrong Media, uh, CDs of uh, okay. Eyes Wide Open, uh, which is still available. Go to headstrongmedia.com and they've got um, CDs. It's like we froze up a third time. <laughs> Twitter for me announcing it. Yeah. 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 Now that's terrific. I, uh, I, my mother listens to, she's got a uh, Bose CD player that she listens to all the time. And I gotten her that, uh, mm -hmm. that CD for, last year she's right. it's playing all the time she loves it oh, wow. excellent beautiful man. well yeah thank you so much david this has been a real honor let me ask you this when you sign your name do you put hall of famer david sanctious or just david sanctious i do no such thing i barely I totally get, would <laughs> i get my, my intelligible little scribble out and that's it i just leave it right there yeah very good well sir i hope uh hope we can do this again at some at some that's point. my pleasure my yeah, pleasure. thank you so much. It's been uh, great. All right, hold on one second. What a treat. Our first Hall of Famer that I know of. We've had some just outstanding, unbelievable musicians. Um, 
I don't believe we've had anybody from the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I hope that you enjoyed that. David Sanctious, unbelievably talented uh, musician. And we didn't talk a ton about it, but he is really good on a guitar as well. Not just a keyboard or piano organ. Um, really talented on guitar as well. So hope hope you enjoyed that. I know I did. That was um, just a, a ton of fun. Um, if this is your first time listening or watching us, maybe you tuned in because of David. You know, if you liked it and you'd like to support us, you know, we're just a father and son team, small town in uh, West Virginia. We started this four years ago. We're getting ready to hit our 500th episode. I can't believe it. And we have had an unbelievable group of guests i would put our guests against any other show out there i really think it's uh, it's been just amazing but if you would like to support us it's real easy if you're watching you can go to youtube meistercon pod please subscribe it's free gives you access to all of our videos if you're listening wherever you're listening from you know whatever uh, podcast application you're listening to just subscribe there That'll help us out. You know, you can find all of those episodes, all 500 of them, audio and video on our website, meistercon.com. And it'll also let you know uh, what we've got upcoming, if we're doing anything in studio, if we're uh, going on location, covering a convention, whatever it is, it'll be on the website, meistercon.com. So please check that out. Thank you guys so, so much. Lots of big stuff coming up for the new year. So keep listening. Keep watching. Thank you guys so much. Bye, everybody.